So now to the first question, why the urgency to improve achievement? Uh, I'm going to just do a very brief uh, few slides that are drawn uh, primarily out of uh, this book called The Race Between Education and Technology. It came out in 2008 by a couple of Harvard professors. Great book. Um, I wouldn't suggest anybody try to read it all, so that's why I've done the, uh, done the, done the slides. Um, and uh, their point, uh, the, the, the major point is that over the course of this last century, uh, that there has been this century-long race between uh, technical, technological innovation uh, and a demand for high skills to be able to use that technology or deploy that technology. And that uh, if technology is moving along at a certain pace and we are supplying uh, more and more educated workers, if the supply of, edu of highly educated workers is outstripping the growth in technology, then uh, the college wage premium should fall. But if the supply of educated workers starts to slow down and technology really starts to, to ramp, ramp up very quickly, uh, and our supply of educated workers aren't keeping up with that growth in technology, then the college wage premium gets, gets very, very high. And, and the, the wage the wages for lesser skilled uh, uh, workers uh, become very depressed. So what this chart is showing is that uh, in the early part of uh, the last century, uh, the United States did a very good job of increasing the supply of high skilled workers. And we did that, uh, this, this goes back to 1900, we did that by, in, in, in essence, inventing the high school. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of high schools uh, at the turn of the century, I, and they became <laughs> much more popular uh, around 1915 and really took off. And when high schools took off, that eventually then started to, to pull up uh, post-secondary uh, education as well. So you had more high school graduates, and then eventually you, had, you, you started to have uh, more and more college graduates. And what that did is it sort of broke down a monopoly to be a monopoly on what, what were called white collar jobs because there were, there were tiny, tiny numbers of college educated people back uh, in 1900 and they would, they would have office jobs and management jobs and those kinds of things and they had a very high premium because there weren't many of them around uh, to compete uh, for work. Uh, but that, that changed between 1900 and 1940. So that's sort of the first, first part of the story. If we look at uh, sort of 1940 on, we continued this upward climb in high school uh, completions uh, from 1940 to about 1980, and that continued to drive up uh, post-secondary, uh, uh, the number of post-secondary graduates as, as well. And we, then in 1980, uh, we hit a kink in the curve. You can see it uh, in the, the self-reported uh, census statistics would suggest that we sort of top out uh, in the high 80% uh, with, with a high school diploma, but that's, uh, that's overestimated in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, it's self-reported. Uh, second of all, it doesn't include uh, institutionalized, so people in the correction system are not answering those questions because they are disproportionately not high school graduates. It also counts, liberally counts, uh, GED as being equivalent uh, to, to, to high school, which uh, in, in name it is supposed to be, but James Heckman from the University of Chicago would argue that uh, when he does his studies, he does not see a, a wage bump uh, that is equivalent with a high school diploma from the GED. And so Heckman's estimates uh, from the University of Chicago, who's a Nobel laureate, uh, would suggest that we topped out uh, at somewhat below 80%. And when you, when you stop that progress uh, at the high school level, you started to slow down. You, 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 can't, you can't see it there, but the rate of growth in the post-secondary is not, not growing at the same rate. And it is really, uh, in Heckman's uh, case or argument, uh, it is that breakdown in the growth of high school diplomas uh, that, that where, this, where this breaks down. 
And so this is what happened to the high school premium, uh, uh, according to these uh, Harvard scholars. Uh, just going back to, <laughs> to 1915, uh, the supply with the, with the creation of the, of the high schools uh, and the increased number of post-secondary graduates, uh, skilled workers outpaced uh, the growth in technology in the first part of the century. And a college wage premium came way down uh, by 1950. It sort of bounced around quite a bit between 1950 and 1980, but was still relatively low to what it was in the beginning of the century. And then when that high school graduation rate sort of tapered off and the, and the growth in the post-secondary rates uh, slowed down some, and technology really started to take off. You have the computer coming in and, and uh, being used on shop floors and replacing uh, workers in many dimensions. Uh, the demand for high school work, the high, highly skilled workers really took off, and we end up with this uh, a college wage premium today that is almost as high as it was, or, or a little bit higher than it was, uh, back in the uh, 1915. So this is um, this is driving uh, some of what you see in terms of the debate with respect to um, inequality of wages. Uh, Lots of, uh, lots of scholars very worried about, um, uh, about the future and the future trends on this, basically saying that uh, anything that, any kind of routine work that you can think of that is done over and over and over in the same way, if it hasn't already been replaced by technology, just wait, it will be. Uh, and that increasingly what we have to be focusing on are things that are, that are idiosyncratic kinds of work, problem solving, project solving, uh, those kinds of skills, rather than the routine. Because the routine, including probably driving in the not distant future, truck drivers, taxi drivers, et cetera, a lot of that work is gonna disappear. Uh, so so the, the need to boost the quality uh, of, of education is uh, uh, increasing rapidly. So now the second question, um, let's think a little bit about uh, who is falling behind and why they're falling behind and, and where the falling behind happens. And I would say that um, you know, 10 years ago, were I to do this presentation, it, wouldn't, it, it would have been uh, quite a bit shorter because we didn't know as much. You'll see quite a few of these citations in here in the footnotes are, 2011, 2012, 2013. Uh, we are acquiring masses of amounts of data. We have been doing an awful lot of testing. I know the educators in the room are probably sick of all the testing that we're doing, but people are actually starting to use some of it uh, to understand, understand uh, what is driving and not driving the learning process. And I am going to say, I'm sure I'm going to offend some people by something that I say in the next 15 minutes about what we think is working and what isn't, so I apologize. Um, and I will also say we're still sort of just crawling out of the dark ages. So the answers, you know, if you don't like them now, keep checking back uh, six months, a year from now, and uh, we'll, we'll know more than we did uh, today. Uh, Great work just, just released uh, in the last month or so by uh, the, the Brookings Institution and the Hamilton Project. I know uh, the Brookings, Brookings has a special relationship uh, in this region and you're very fortunate to have them. Hamilton Project at Brookings in particular, very, very sharp folks and, and a good site uh, to follow on education matters. This just came out, uh, boy, I think maybe three weeks ago. Uh, and <coughs> The point of this, this particular piece is uh, looking at uh, early childhood longitudinal survey data, uh, the growing consensus is, uh, well, uh, is that you don't have uh, big differences in cognitive ability uh, that are predicted by income level of, of a baby. So this is looking at uh, children under the age of one and cognitive ability. It's very hard to measure, obviously, but some of this uh, data has been able to predict uh, uh, age five IQ tests, et cetera. So basically what this is saying is that uh, the additional month of age, they're gaining a bunch of cognitive skill for each month that they, uh, that they have been living uh, since their birth through age one. 
females are a little statistically a little bit smarter than males. Second, born children a little bit less statistically. I'm not going to show that. Well, it washes out because I have a daughter. Uh, who's, uh, but, uh, but, yeah, she, she'd throw something at me if, I, if she knew I was showing this chart because uh, she's very um, competitive with her brother, older brother. But uh, with respect to income level of the family, uh, they find no statistical relationship at birth, which is, um, I think, a very, it's a very hopeful finding, um, and one that obviously then spells out the challenge. So then what, what happens, uh, I don't know if uh, folks have seen this work, uh, this, is, this is older work uh, out of the University of Kansas, uh, where a couple of researchers sat down and literally with different families uh, sat down and counted the number of words that were spoken to children. Uh, this is their term, welfare families, working class families, and professional families. And counted up uh, how many words an hour were spoken uh, and uh, had these vast differences. And it was not only uh, <laughs> the number of words that were spoken, but the kinds of words that were spoken. So the words uh, that were spoken to children of, of wealth, uh, parents who were on welfare were much more sort of directive, uh, you know, stop, sit down, be quiet, et cetera. Uh, whereas uh, the words that were spoken by the professionals were, you know, what do you think of that, the mountains over there, or uh, ex much more interpretive. And increasingly what you're going to see, and what, if you think of some of the research, and, and look for this when you, when you read about a new study that comes out on an educational intervention, uh, incre increasingly you see that uh, you have impact, sometimes an intervention will have an impact on math, but it doesn't have an impact on reading. I think the growing consensus of academics that keep finding this over and over again is that so much of the, <laughs> the, the, the reading and the comprehensive abilities are being taught at home in those early years uh, and that really what's going on in the school is sort of driving, driving the math achievement. Because we don't sit down and do addition and subtraction before kids go to bed. But we do read to them, uh, or many families do read to them. So that's, that's a big piece. Another one that is really uh, uh, emerging and is uh, concerning scholars is differential <laughs> at-home investment. Uh, as incomes start to separate for high-income and low-income families, the ability of those families to invest in their children in things like music or SAT prep classes or tutoring or what have you uh, has started to pull away. So here you can see, and these are in constant $2,008, um, you know, there was a gap in the 70s, but you can see uh, the investment by the higher income families much higher uh, uh, in, present, in present time, which again reinforces this next graph, uh, which, which is the um, measured achievement gaps between the 90th percentile uh, or children in the 90th percentile income family and children in the 10th percentile income family going back over time. So these are kids born in, the, in 1943. There was an income gap or a, an achievement gap between those kids back in 1943. Um, I'll a, a standard deviation in achievement, uh, give you just a rough rule of thumb, uh, two-tenths of a standard deviation uh, in a gap is equal to about six months of learning. So <coughs> we were back at uh, six tenths back here. Uh, it's grown to 1.2 standard deviations uh, for, for the uh, most recent cohorts of kids. Uh, and th so that is translating to you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of three years uh, of achievement uh, uh, between the, the, the tenth and ninth. So in essence, what you have there is, at birth, no difference, uh, and by the time they get into the, uh, into the educational uh, system, uh, a good two, three, potentially as much as four years of difference um, in achievement. 
So then the question is, uh, what do we do about that? We've got you know, three to four years of achievement to try to, uh, to, try to deal with. Uh, so what has been tried, what has been measured, and what appears to work? I'd say again, 10 years ago, I was asked this question by uh, uh, the group of foundations in Oregon. Uh, they said, uh, John, we want the biggest list of best practices so that we can go out and fund them, et cetera. And if you really tried to apply the same kind of scientific standard that medicine does in medical trials or drug trials, uh, randomized trials where you put an intervention with, uh, put a kid through an intervention and another kid through, we just didn't have much of that kind of evidence. Uh, what was known 10 years ago about what worked uh, didn't have the benefit of all of the measurement that we've been doing through this accountability process, and it didn't have the benefit of, uh, of much experimental design. Uh, in, in no small part because we don't like to study kids that way. It's, it's, it, it's sort of ethically hard for us to do to say, okay, we think this is going to work, uh, and so we're going to sort some kids over here and we're just, you know, have these kids over here and, and measure them over the rest of their lives. Just a very small handful of things uh, that, that, that we have seen. But now, uh, more and more measurement, I, I think people are, are starting to uh, come out increasingly. It, again, this is something where literally, I think every, every couple of months, this presentation expands with, with a new finding. So I broke this, again, sort of thinking back to Lisa's question, into um, sort of the arguments uh, of what works or what has been argued to work inside of the K, and I'm saying the K-12 schoolhouse, and uh, versus those things that take place around uh, the schoolhouse in the community. And so here again is this notion of standard deviations uh, and this uh, scale here, you'll see nothing goes past 0.3 in terms of an effect size. Remember, 0.2, roughly uh, six months uh, of learning uh, in a typical typical school year. So uh, here is here's what we're what we're saying here is uh, you can well, the folks in the back are not going to be able to see these sort of faded top bars, but um, you do have fade out effects, so there are some uh, reading recovery program. It's a very um, prescribed uh, literacy tutoring program that grew out of New Zealand. Um, at the time that it's delivered, looks like it has an effect of about 0.3. It fades out over time uh, as they measure the kids over, over years. Uh, full day Head Start, or, or full day kindergarten for Head Start students. Uh, that appears to sort of settle at a point one or, or three months of learning. Full day kindergarten, this is where people might start throwing things at me, uh, but full day kindergarten uh, for uh, non-Head Start students, uh, most of the evidence to this point is pointing to uh, there's an impact sort of at the end of kindergarten, but it completely fades away uh, downstream, and that's one you're going to want to pay, pay attention to and sort of see as the evidence emerges on that. Uh, Class sizes, um, class sizes uh, this is one of the areas where we do benefit from a very rigorous experiment in Tennessee, the Tennessee STAR program, uh, and there have been other uh, sort of smaller quasi-experimental studies as well. But Tennessee STAR was done very well. People continue to write journal articles about it. And uh, the growing consensus is a class size uh, probably makes the most difference in the very earliest grades, uh, kindergarten through, through uh, second grade. Uh, and then beyond that, um, all bets are off, uh, particularly as you get further in. Now, uh, I, I would say uh, most of these have been measured uh, comparing schools that are in the, maybe the low 20s for class sizes to the high 20s or, or, or 30. Uh, in Oregon, we're starting to experiment with 35 to 40 uh, and I, most of those studies aren't working in that, uh, in, in that range, so you have to pay attention to what they're studying. But that's, that's where most of the scholarly evidence is going to be sitting on, um, on class sizes. Ten additional school days, uh, fairly small effect. A 10% increase in per-student spending, relatively small effect, if, if it's just simply 
10% increase without any direction um, on what it is spent on. Uh, this one over here, um, a pretty sizable one, is the difference, uh, the difference in um, learning between a teacher who is in the top quartile of effectiveness versus one who's in the bottom quartile of effectiveness. And there you can see you're, you're getting up and approaching point three, and that's a pretty solid one. That is, this is the, the kind of research that is coming fast and furiously uh, due to a massive investment uh, by the Gates Foundation uh, to, to, to study uh, teaching effectiveness across the country and, and understand how to evaluate uh, effective teachers. Um, the difference between a first year and a fifth year teacher, um, experience, uh, teaching experience um, is valuable as it has been measured in those initial years. Teachers gain uh, effectiveness and then it tapers off probably in years six and seven and sort of plateaus. Uh, effectiveness doesn't change a whole lot between years 10 and 30. Uh, Teach for America, I think there was somebody here from Teach for America. Uh, this one, uh, uh, effective, but they're sort of relative to, the, uh, to those other measures. Um, an advanced degree, simply having a teacher with a master's versus a, a, a teacher with a, a bachelor's degree, on average, uh, no, no effect. And then a variety of things here on charter schools, um, you know, a couple very specific interventions where they're very deliberate. TIP, uh, the Har Harlem Children's Zone, and some others have, have been showing some pretty spectacular uh, impacts. The national average, which is sort of saying, uh, how is the average experience in an Italian restaurant uh, across the country uh, is positive, uh, but obviously not as big it, 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 as a very specific intervention uh, uh, for, for TIP. So that's inside the schoolhouse. Then around the schoolhouse, uh, a couple different intervent high quality pre kindergarten. Um, again, big impact sort of at the time that they delivered, but uh, as you see them downstream, uh, concerns about fade out effect there. Nurse family partnership, uh, sort of the same issue. Even start and early head start, uh, not, not showing a lot of effectiveness. One-on-one uh, -on -one reading and tutoring programs by adults and by peers, which can sometimes be delivered outside of the school building. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly showing impacts in, uh, as, as is ELL tu tutoring and after school programs, et cetera. So a lot of, uh, of things that, uh, you know, the, we have uh, the United Way here, uh, uh, other uh, funders of nonprofits uh, who are delivering mentoring programs in and around uh, the school building uh, have, and again, sort of relative to their cost, uh, some important effects. This one is an, is an interesting one. Again, just came out in the last six or seven months. Um, if you simply get $1,000 of an earned income tax credit, into a family's budget relative to a family that was eligible for it and didn't get it, uh, they have tied that uh, to educational uh, improvement. So for each $1,000 in an earned income tax credit and that extra boost of income that that provides, uh, they were able to tie that to, uh, to, to student achievement. That's uh, Raj Chetty out of Harvard pulled that together with the IRS, that study. A, a program that pays students to read uh, shows some impacts. Harlem Children's Zones Community Bundle, uh, so they had a lot of the baby college and another program outside uh, at this point uh, inconclusive. And then simply uh, there's the Moving for Opportunity program, uh, which was a, a major demonstration project where they randomly picked kids out of uh, very difficult neighborhoods and put them into uh, more affluent neighborhoods. Uh, they did not see uh, big impacts on achievement when that happened. So, uh, and one last one, and, I, and I'm talking about these uh, again, or we're spending some good time with them because uh, these are the kind
kinds of things that can be delivered, uh, people have to get to these. Kids uh, and families have to run into these programs if they're going to be picked up by them. This is one of the most exciting ones I've come across in some time. Uh, it was a uh, randomized trial uh, done by H&R Block, uh, where uh, it was in North Carolina, and they had parents that were coming in for tax assistance, and they asked the parents uh, if they saw uh, that they had a 17 or 18 year old, uh, they said, uh, would you like us to uh, run a, a FAFSA form for you? We've already collected all your, your pertinent financial information. Uh, they did that uh, on a random basis. Uh, so some people were made that offer, other people were not made that offer. Uh, and the ones who took up, or the ones who were selected and got the FAFSA information, uh, their kids uh, had better uh, college attendance, uh, they persisted uh, more than the controls, and they were more likely to have uh, received Pell assistance from the federal government. Uh, and this was a virtually costless program. Yes? I think my understanding of the of the of the demonstration is that they went in thinking they were getting tax assistance and, and maybe EITC refund, uh, and and this was sort of a hidden feature. So again, another community-based solution, very low-cost community-based solution with with uh, with a sizable impact. So three takeaways from all of that. Number one, I think the growing evidence is the achievement gap is established primarily outside of the K-12 schools in families and communities. And so that sort of proves Lisa's point that if, uh, if you're gonna do something about the achievement gap, uh, it's gonna take place with the family and in the community uh, before kindergarten. Uh, and to date, K-12 schools have done little appreciably to increase or decrease the gap. Uh, I didn't have a slide for that, but we found this in Oregon, and James Heckman has reported on this. I would suspect we find it in Nevada as well, is that that gap appears, uh, you typically the first time a kid is tested is third grade. That gap appears in third grade uh, and might be two years behind. And what we find in K-12 schools is that it, it's like a track race, and the two packs of kids are running, and they're running at the same pace while they're in K-12. But the, the, the trailing pack never, never catches up. They run at about the same pace, and that achievement gap stays relatively constant throughout that experience, but ultimately results by the time you get to 11th and 12th grade to lots of dropouts and adverse consequences for the trailing, uh, the trailing pack. And so then that last piece is the opportunities to decrease the gap exist both inside and around the K-12 schoolhouse, which uh, means that we should support the educators in this room as much as we possibly can and commiserate because they've got tremendously difficult jobs. Uh, but it also reinforces the fact that groups like this, subsets of this group, uh, or maybe even a bigger group than this, they need to be working together uh, to make sure that the environment around that school uh, has the resources and accessibility to uh, the kinds of things that, that we described, pre-K, uh, nurse family partnership, uh, EITC assistance, uh, FAFSA assistance, all of those kinds of things uh, in order to help uh, reduce that gap. And so 